It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. All right, let's get to it. Winning Cures Everything. I'm your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on X at GaryWCE. WinningCuresEverything.com is the website. And we talk college football year-round on this show. Hopefully everybody has had a good week thus far. we still got the weekend going. But it is the Friday, March 8th edition of the show. And it is the afternoon drive home edition. Typically I've been doing this in the mornings. But, uh, you know, couldn't quite get the show put together. And thank God... Because there was so much stuff that happened today that uh, that we're going to dive into. I mean, it has been an absolute train wreck. Just all the CFP stuff, right? The uh, the NFL trying to get the uh, the CFP to move their uh, some of their games for this year. Not not even like in the future. Just like for this year, stuff that's been set for a year. Um, you know, the Chris Lowe stuff. Of course, we're going to talk about that. Uh, let's see, football awards won't be in EA College Football, uh, the video game. I mean, it's just, what a what a Friday it has been. What a Friday it's been. If you're uh, watching the show, yeah, my hair is a complete debacle. The beard is a debacle. I am, uh, I am traveling next week, so I'm headed to the barbershop this evening to go and get this thing chopped off. So by the time you guys see this, I will uh, probably have new hair, new beard, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, good things. Good things indeed. Let's uh let's go on and dive into it because it, it shouldn't be a long trip home. So I I've got plenty that we need to discuss. We'll start off with this. Uh topic one oh, subscribe if you have not already done so. I would certainly appreciate that. Subscribe to the podcast, subscribe of course to the YouTube page. And uh again, reach out to me on X or if you're old school, you can always email me, Gary at winningcureseverything.com if there is anything that you would like for me to discuss on the show. With that said, let's dive into it. There's way too much going on. Topic number one. The college football playoff negotiations are a complete debacle. They're a dumpster fire right now. The biggest thing so Ross Dellinger has done an absolutely amazing job of detailing everything that is going on inside of these meetings, right? And the basic premise of everything that's happening right now is that the SEC and the Big Ten are kind of throwing their weight around, right? So we all know Heather Dennett at ESPN reported uh, a little bit, but this this also, I believe, came from Ross maybe earlier in the week. The, the whole idea of the Big Ten and the SEC getting the two guaranteed buys in the 14-team format, uh, that's pretty much dead on arrival. That's not going to happen. A lot of pushback on that, and I can understand that. I'm pretty sure that the Big Ten and the SEC are going to be the ones that get it most of the time. But you do still have to give the other conferences some kind of a chance, so why not? Sure. Makes, uh, Makes all the sense in the world, I guess. I suppose. But yeah, that uh, there was an article on ESPN from Heather Dennett about that, so I would certainly suggest uh, that you check that one out. But the Ross Dellinger piece was much, much more detailed. The SEC, um, so so here's the deal: the format for the CFP is being worked on as we speak, but at the same time. The format is not nearly as important as figuring out what the financials are going to be, how the revenue distribution is going to be set. And that's what the majority of these meetings have been about. And Bill Hancock, the executive director of the CFP, is the one that set a deadline of basically next week, maybe in the next two weeks, sometime around there. Uh, I would imagine no later than the end of March. Uh, that they want to get this thing completely done. And the reason that they want it completely done by then is because the TV contract with ESPN it could potentially go away. So you're up against a deadline. You've got a, a bit of a crunch situation here. And it appears 
that the SEC and the Big Ten are willing to walk away from the table and set up their own thing where they would make all the money as opposed to the other conferences being, you know, set to do their own thing. Okay. Like, I, I don't know. I think the TV networks would certainly give them the money. But when you have a situation like that, other conferences are absolutely going to break down. It is going to be a disaster for this sport because if you don't have everybody involved, I don't think the fans are going to be as into it. But that's, I mean, that's just a personal thing. I don't know that for sure. So who knows? But the, the current numbers right now, this revenue distribution, you are setting up an even clearer power two and then everybody else. Right, you've got the power two, the middle two, and everybody else. And the way that it is going down is seven hundred and sixty million dollars for the Big Ten and the SEC to split. So that would basically be somewhere around twenty three million dollars per school for the SEC, twenty one million per school for the Big Ten, uh, and then four hundred and forty million dollars for the ACC and the Big Twelve. Uh, and I, if I remember correctly it was a little over 13 million per ACC school and a little less than 13 million per Big 12 school uh, and then you've got 115 million dollars that would be split between Notre Dame and all of the G5 teams uh, for the G5 teams you're looking at it's south of two million dollars per school from this deal so you are setting up just a massive massive difference in the schools uh, going forward. I mean, just revenue-wise. We already knew that the TV contracts were wild, and and they were heavily, heavily skewed towards the Big uh, Ten and the SEC. But this is just a completely different level. Completely different level. Uh, And yet, if the ACC and the Big 12 don't agree to it, there is a possibility that... The Big Ten and the SEC can go off and do their own thing. So if they're talking about taking $760 million out of a $1.3 billion deal, do we think that an SEC Big Ten only playoff could generate $800 million a year? Could you get more to go and do it on your own? Could, could you get a billion dollars a year for an SEC Big Ten playoff? I mean, those are the biggest brands that you would want, right? It, it, imagine having... Uh, Alabama versus Ohio State, Georgia versus Penn State, Tennessee versus Michigan. It's like all those kind of games. Of course, you bring in USC, you know, USC against Texas. Uh, Just just name off even the new schools that come in. Washington, USC, Oregon, UCLA. I don't know that UCLA is going to be there anytime soon, but you you get the point. If you set up like an eight-team playoff, where four of each of those leagues gets in, maybe you can get a billion dollars just for yourself. So then how much is an ACC, Big 12, and everybody else playoff worth? And then at that point, if that were to happen, does that force Notre Dame to join the Big 10? Right? I mean, this is, this is wild stuff that's coming out right now. It is, it is huge, huge stuff. Uh, the contract, here's another interesting part that came out, and I haven't seen anybody really paying attention to this. The contract is expected to include a look-in provision in 2028. And the reason that that's going to be put in is in case of more conference realignment. And the person that it was requested by was actually Brett Yormark. So now, of course, I have all kinds of questions. Is the Big 12 about to... uh, are, Are they about to expand again? Are they... Are they looking to pick off some of these ACC schools? Are they? I mean, what's what is happening with the Big Twelve? There's a lot of questions there for sure. There, of course, there's even more ACC stuff, right? Uh, Dellinger put in some really interesting facts about the ACC deal with ESPN. I did not realize that 2021 is when ESPN was supposed to decide whether or not they wanted to exercise their option with the ACC deal. But Jim Phillips being hired in December of 2020, he didn't start until February 2021, he got it amended that ESPN would not make their decision to exercise the option until February of 2025. 
That's in about mm, 10 months or so, give or take. If that's the case, did he exercise that option so that he could, you know, get his feet on the ground and take a look at everything that's going on? Was it him or was he asking ESPN to, hey, let's push this back so that we can figure out this landscape because ESPN was likely about to tell them, no, we're not going to exercise and your TV deal is going to be done after 2027. Is that what the deal was? And I, I got to tell you, I am incredibly curious because, I mean, this is, this is big stuff, right? Uh, if you remember, the reason why Texas and Oklahoma came to the SEC back in 2020 is because early in 2020, maybe late 2019, Bob Bowlesby went to ESPN and Fox and tried to get them to uh, extend their contract. And those two told him, nah, we're good. Like, we, we actually think we're paying you guys too much as it is. A- at that point, like, they weren't going to make more money. That's why Texas and Oklahoma said, yeah, okay, we see what the SEC is about to do with ESPN. We need to get in on that because we can't compete at a national level when our peers are making twice as much as we are. And that's exactly what happened with the Big Ten as well. The Big Ten goes out, they get California. Uh, All of their schools are, you know, pretty much guaranteed to make around $100 million a year. But when you've got Big 12 schools that are making 30 to 40 and ACC schools that are making somewhere between 30 and 40, but then you've got Big Ten and SEC schools already making $100 million and, and with the CFP contract, potentially more, the split is huge. I mean, just absolutely huge. So, again, biggest thing out of this, I mean, there's so many big things, but I this ACC deal... ESPN has to exercise the option by February of 2025. Does ESPN think that that is as much of a sweetheart deal as we think it is? If Florida State gets out of the ACC, how much are the rest of the schools in that league worth? Uh, Are you going to pay $38 million a year for SMU and Boston College and Wake Forest and whatever? You know, especially, think about this. If you take Florida State out... And you take Wake Forest out, or or does this give the ACC more time to come up with a eh, an uneven revenue distribution model, right? Can they go in and redo the contract to where, well, Clemson and Florida State and Miami and North Carolina and blah 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 are going to make this much money, and everybody else you're only going to make this much money, and if you want to pull out, then cool. But. Uh, There was something else that was brought up in it, and that was the idea that if those schools, like if ESPN decides to not uh, jump in on that, could they potentially break up the ACC? Not ESPN, but those other schools. Could they break up the ACC? And all those schools I talked about, Florida State, North Carolina, NC State, Clemson, blah, 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 Miami, et cetera. Could they break up the ACC? and potentially, potentially form a smaller league to where they might be able to earn more money. That gets tricky, right? So I'm, I am so intrigued by this. That Dellinger article over at Yahoo Sports is, I I retweeted it, so go to my Twitter page, at GaryWCE. I would highly, highly recommend that you read it, because this deal is the future of college football if it ends up being agreed to. And if they don't agree to it, then we could be looking at a split sooner than later. And by the way, all of this money stuff has to do with the fact that everybody knows that you're going to have to pay athletes going forward. So you want to make sure that you are set up for whatever the athlete compensation model looks like as we head into the future. I mean, just bananas. Absolutely bananas. Uh, I'm, I don't even know what to say about it. Don't even know what to say. Um, again, if you haven't hit, sub- yeah, excuse me, hit that subscribe button uh, over on the YouTube page. Hit that subscribe button as well. Hit the like button. Blah 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 blah. I've been doing this members only for the drive home show. This one, I might make this one public because there, there's so much stuff in this. I mean, it's just huge, just huge. Uh, number two 
on the top of the list. Number two. The NFL is trying to convince the CFP to move games off of Saturday, December 21st. There are three college football playoff games on Saturday, December 21st. This con- or contract, this calendar, has been set for, I, if I'm not mistaken, more than a year. I think it was last January, like right after the national championship game last year. Uh, I believe that that's when it was set up. And the NFL has not announced their schedule yet. But as it sits right now, that is the date that the NFL has targeted for, you know, kind of a late season Saturday showcase. That's that's what they're wanting. Uh, and there's an article about this over at awfulannouncing.com. Uh, and I think, uh, let's see, Ben Axelrod is, is who actually wrote it. Great stuff on this. Uh, John Orand is, I believe, who actually reported it. So his, his stuff is over at Puck. Highly recommend you subscribe to their newsletter. Um, and yes, Puck, like a hockey puck. P-U-C-K. So, this is very interesting, right? Uh, the NFL is hopeful that the CFP, it, they don't expect them to move all three of the games off of that date. But they do think that they can get by if they move one of them. Because you don't want... If you're the NFL or the college football playoff, you don't want the overlap, right? Like, enough people are going to watch both of these, but both of those leagues, especially in these situations, would prefer the standalone spots. That's what they want. And the TV contracts would really prefer the standalone spots. I mean, that's why they pay that much money for the CFP. That's why they pay that much money for the NFL. You want as many people as possible watching every single broadcast of yours. I mean, it's that, that's why the NFL does so many standalone windows. Amazon's got their game on Thursday. ESPN's got their game on Monday. You know, you got the Sunday night NBC spot. Like, it, that's the way it is. And especially with playoff games, you get later in the season, all that kind of stuff. With the CFP, there's a reason that these networks are paying so much more for the CFP than they are for uh, the regular season, etc., I mean, they, they, these playoff games, ESPN has already said, are worth about $25 million a piece for the first round games. I mean, that's a lot of money. So, do you want to pay that much if you're going head to head with an NFL game? Probably not. What's. What this can do. Because both of them could just stand their ground, right? Let the TV networks figure out when they want to time these things and whatnot. We'll, we'll figure it out. But what they could do is, or what it could do, is show us what this relationship is going to be like going forward. Is the NFL going to be willing to work with the college football playoff? Because while you don't see these two, you know, holding hands and whatnot, just going right down the line, you know that they do work together and they try and make this stuff, they they figure this thing out. Because the NFL and college football, they are bed buddies. I mean, let's be real about this, you know? So... I do think and this is something else that made it very interesting about expanding the playoff, right? You're going to get into NFL windows. Do you want to do that? Like, the NFL is the biggest thing in the country. If you're college football, do you want to Do you want to play off of that? Or, you know, do you want to uh, work with these guys as much as you can? I, we'll see who's got the most power, and, what, and we know the NFL has the most power. But... It's going to be interesting to figure out what they're going to end up doing with this. Uh, Speaking of TV windows, topic number three. Fox is going to do a Friday night college football game on Big Fox. Now, FS1 has been doing a Friday night game for a long time, usually Mountain West. Uh, I'm curious if that's going to continue or not. But Fox has got deals with the Big Ten, the Big 12, and uh, the Mountain West, as I just mentioned. They don't have WWE Friday Night SmackDown anymore. Uh, Mike Mulvihill at Fox is who, you know, came up with this. They, he's, he's basically who generated the, uh, the big noon kickoff on Saturdays, which last year averaged well over 6 million viewers for that noon kickoff game. It, it's a great TV window that, nobody ever really took advantage of because no none of these teams ever really wanted to play at noon except for Ohio State and Michigan. But then you figure out, like, oh, if, if we were to do this early, 
people are ready to watch football immediately on Saturday. They don't want to watch Iowa and Northwestern, you know, with, God bless her, Beth Moen's uh, calling the game or whatever, right? It's it, that's, that's not what football fans want to begin with. They don't want the, the Jefferson Pilot whatever SEC game. They want big games right off the bat immediately. Uh, I would almost guarantee you're not going to get some of the biggest brands in the Big Ten to do this. Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, et cetera, they all have complained in the past about having to play Friday night games. So I would imagine that a lot of those you're not going to see. But some of these up-and-coming Big Ten teams, yeah, you'll probably get some of those on. The Big 12, I think, is up for anything. Brett Yormark has let it be known. We want these exclusive windows. We want people watching our product. We we want to build this thing up right uh, because they need to, right? The Big 12 is not as big as the Big Ten. And and we're not talking about size of conferences because the Big Ten is 18 teams and the Big 12 is currently 16, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, this is going to take a long time to get used to. But that's the deal, right? That's what we're looking at. We have got uh, just... It, it's it's going to be weird to see. Mountain West, I, I'm sure you're probably going to get some Boise games uh, to move over to uh, t- t- Friday nights. Probably going to get some Boise games on Friday on Fox. Probably going to get some, you know, big time Big 12 games. Utah might get a Colorado game here and there. Uh, you You want to have as many people on those games as humanly possible. And Fox will be able to do that. Uh, I think it could be absolutely huge. ESPN Friday nights, I mean, they've, just, they've been a debacle. You've got some good matchups here and there. You had Utah and Oregon State last year for one of the, I think it was week four, week five, week six, somewhere around there, early early to mid-season. Uh, and that was a pretty good game. You know, top 20 matchup, all that kind of stuff. But typically, typically you would get the bottom of the Pac-12 against each other, or you would get AAC teams. I mean, I remember specifically seeing uh, Florida Atlantic and Charlotte on a Friday night ESPN game. You did get Memphis and Tulane. That was a good Friday night game. But, like, the, these do not compare. Like, they, they're just not going to bring in the same kind of viewership, especially on a cable network, that you will get on, you know, over-the-top television. Like, when you have a broadcast partner like Fox who is willing to go in on Friday night games, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's a pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. Uh, but we'll see. I, I, like I said, I want to see if FS1 games continue. Uh, I don't know if Fox wants to... I don't know if they want the competition on one of their own networks. We'll see. Uh, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, let me tell you right quick, tickets are expensive. You guys know this. I mean, it's ridiculous. You're going to see River Beat Fest in Memphis. It's like 250 bucks for a three-day pass and all that kind of stuff. Tickets to concerts are expensive. Tickets to games are expensive. We got college baseball season coming up. We got uh, we got the NBA playoffs coming up. I mean, just all kinds of stuff happening. And tickets are crazy. Why not save a little bit of money? Do yourself a favor. Go to Ticketsmarter.com. Put in the promo code WCE10 to get $10 off an order of $100 or more or WCE20, that's WCE20, to get $20 off an order of $300 or more. Like I said, these tickets are expensive. You should save money wherever you can, and this is not a one-time code. You can use it every single time that you go to the website. Save some money. Think smarter. Ticket smarter. All right, topic number four. The NCFAA, that's the National College Football Awards Association, They've said that they will not be in the EA College Football video game. The awards won't be in the game. So you've got uh, the Bednarik, the Blitnikoff, Davey O'Brien, the Doak Walker Award. Uh, Let's see, what else? Jim Thorpe, the Outland Trophy, the Maxwell Trophy, the Lou Groza Award. uh, Best punter, I believe. No, no, no. This is the best kicker. Uh, And then the Ray Guy and the Outland Trophy, right? They're not going to be in the game. And the reason behind it, uh, Mark Wolpert, he told On3 that EA, for all intents and purposes, didn't offer enough money. He said, you know, we gave it to them uh, for really, really cheap compared to what we should have back when this game was going on the first time. But EA came to us with an offer. We told them 
no, we need this much money. And EA said, yeah, all right, then we just won't have it in the game. And he tried to kind of lambast EA. He tried to talk about, you know, they said they want this thing to be as authentic as possible. Uh, how are you going to make it authentic if you don't have these awards in the game? And, and look, the bottom line is, if you just say it's the, the best wide receiver award, if you say it's the best kicker award, like a lot of younger kids don't know who these players were. So they don't know what the awards are. They just have no idea. So it doesn't matter to them if you don't have the Lou Groza award. It doesn't matter if you have the, the Ray Guy award. Like, it just it doesn't matter to them. So I don't really know what the word... The fact that EA even offered anything for them to be in the game, like, if I were them, I probably would have taken it. I mean, this is something that's that's big because the, the numbers for that TV show that ESPN puts on, I mean, they're not great, you know? This is not some huge deal. So I don't know why Mark Wolpert uh, wanted to try and ask for more money, try and haggle with these guys, knowing that now they got to pay players, they got to do all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, it's it's kind of ridiculous. Or maybe it's just a pride thing. Hey, you're paying all these players. Like, now you got to pay the players, that means you got to pay us more. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. Uh, I will say this. Um, I, <laughs> Clark Brooks, uh, SEC Stat Cat, on Twitter, he said this would be a perfect Andy Staple Show segment where you go through and you you rename the awards for EA. So if you can get, you're already going to have some of these legends in the game. So do you offer Johnny Manziel, you know, a thousand bucks or whatever to use his name in the game? And then name the quarterback award instead of the Davey O'Brien award. Do you name it the Johnny Manziel best quarterback award? Like, <laughs> I think it's genius. I, I think it's, uh, I, I'm really, I'm really surprised that they did this. Because uh, it just, again, you got to, I understand knowing your worth. But that that's, I mean, it's in that phrase. Know your worth. Like, what are you doing? Just ridiculous. Uh, number five, Chris Lowe had an incredible article about the coaching change at Alabama. Um, and I, I've got to tell you, it was incredibly revealing. I mean, it, the, getting Nick Saban to talk as much as he did in this was uh, surprising to me. And I know that he's going to be a media member, and I know that he's going to have to talk on TV, and you're going to get to see a lot more into him than you typically would. And sometimes in press conferences he would say stuff and whatnot. This was very surprising. Very, very surprising. Um, Saban revealed, you know, basically that the culture with the athletes at Alabama was changing. Like, these guys wanted playing time. They wanted NIL assurances. They wanted, like, all this kind of stuff. And that's what they came in talking about after losing to Michigan. It wasn't, you know, everybody's in this together. We're coming back. We're going to try this again. You know, we should have beaten Michigan. It was it was none of that. It was just a completely different mindset than what he's used to. And I think it actually showed he was really, really smart to get out when he did. Because there are other coaches that can handle those kind of mindsets. Because if that's what all the athletes are going to be like, you need somebody that understands how to do that. And Saban knows, yo, I wasn't good with professional athletes in the NFL. Right? Like, he, he was still an incredible coach. Uh, finished with a, a decent record in two years at Miami. It's it's not like he was awful. Um, but he wasn't great with, you know, dealing with these kids that felt like they had a little more... They had egos, right, in the NFL. You got egos. It's a it's a profession. So it's it's different building a team in the NFL than it is in college. But now you're turning college into a professional organization. Kids are making money. Kids want to be guaranteed things. They want assurances before they sign somewhere, like all this kind of stuff, right? And it's not like this stuff wasn't going on before. It's just it's so much more out in the open. It's so, like, nobody gets in trouble for anything anymore. It just completely changes the mindset. And where I talked in the past about it being a capitalistic society, I think I might have misspoken. I think it's more of an individualistic society. 
Uh, because I think more people are only worried about themselves. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just different. Right? So maybe that's something to pay attention to going forward to see about some of these coaches that may be more suited to do what Nick Saban did with his team building and with the, the attitude that he wanted. Uh, him talking about the players throwing helmets after the loss to Michigan and all that kind of he He didn't like that. Didn't like that at all. Uh, I found it very interesting. Uh, the other interesting part of that was um, they revealed that Greg Byrne, the Alabama AD, only called two candidates. Kalen DeBoer, obviously, accepted the job. But, uh, but he also called Mike Norvell at Florida State. So there was no Steve Sarkeesian. There was no Lane Kiffin. There was no it, nothing else. He called two guys, both of which are represented by Jimmy Sexton, who is Saban's agent. And one of them took the job. And that part was incredibly revealing. And the Mike Norvell stuff I found super interesting because of what else it said about Florida State, which takes us to our next topic, right? And there's a lot more in that Chris Lowe article. I would highly recommend you read that one as well. Go over to ESPN.com. You, uh, you'll be able to find it. You'll be able to find it. Okay, so the next topic is number, duh, 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 let me get turned here, number six, topic number six, Lane Kiffin. Lane Kiffin had a, uh, a pretty busy couple of days here, <laughs> and it, at least news-wise, right? Because it's not like all this stuff happened right now. Uh, we'll start, the first one, I mean, he did uh, hire Zach Arnett as a defensive analyst. That's former Mississippi State head coach and former Mississippi State defensive coordinator under Mike Leach. Uh, he is going to be a defensive analyst. And, man, you want to talk about making people mad down in Starkville. I mean, good gracious. Uh, the fact that Zach Arnett did not get picked up to be a defensive coordinator somewhere is shocking. Uh, but it's also really interesting because this, it, Arnett's a good defensive coach. And the fact that Ole Miss gets him for pennies on the dollar to be an analyst right now while Mississippi State is having to pay him his contract is absolutely hilarious i mean that is that is all-time troll stuff and i love it i love it uh you wouldn't have seen this kind of stuff back in the day I, and i say that but man i remember bill oliver uh leaving as alabama's defensive coordinator to go over and be uh the defense coordinator for auburn back in like what was that 1995 or whatever it was uh, he thought that he was going to get the uh he thought he was going to get the alabama head coaching job when gene stallings Retired, but regardless. Uh, so, so Ole Miss hires Zach Arnett, and that is level one trolling by Lane Kiffin and that bunch. Absolutely love it. Uh, Mississippi State is paying this guy uh, to try and beat them. <laughs> That's hilarious to me. Absolutely hilarious. Uh, number two, Chris Lowe's article that I just talked about, just talked about, said that Florida State was ready to hire Lane Kiffin if Mike Norvell took the Alabama job. And I find that so interesting. I think that would have been such a great fit. Now, the question is, would Lane Kiffin have taken the job? Because Kiffin keeps up with all this stuff. He knows about the ACC situation. He knows what's going on with Florida State and everything else. This, this man is on top of social media. He knows what's happening. So if he knows what's happening... Uh, does he jump over to Florida State where, you know, they're trying like hell to get out of that conference? I'm certain that Florida State has got money. They got bags, and they want to win. And you know that you can get talent there. But I think Kiffin has shown with the transfer portal and Ole Miss opening up the bank and all that for uh, for all these kids that he's bringing in, he's shown he can win at Ole Miss. And now he doesn't have to go against Nick Saban every year. You still got to deal with Kirby Smart. You got to deal with Steve Sarkeesian, but do you think Lane Kiffin is scared of those guys? I mean, maybe Georgia, a little bit, but I don't know. I, it's it's one of the great what ifs. I know that Kiffin would fit down there. Do we think that? I mean, Kiffin is a modern day Steve Spurrier, so he would be fantastic at Florida State. Absent because Florida State hadn't really had that. They had Jimbo. They had Bobby Bowden forever. You know, Willie Taggart 
whatever. And Mike Norvell kind of keeps his nose to the grindstone. I, I think they would love it. I think they absolutely would have loved him, but I don't know that Kiffin takes the job because I think that he understands the importance of being in the SEC of the Big Ten right now. That's what I think. Uh, and then finally, the third thing, Kiffin uh, said that he would have been in the EA game for free. And he said that hopefully next year coaches will be in the game. Uh, I don't know that all coaches would be in the game for free. But, again, this is Kiffin understanding marketing. He knows how this works. He wants to be in people's faces all the time. He wanted to be in that game. And I don't blame him. I don't blame him. So I thought that was huge. Uh, Last topic of the day, again, subscribe, uh, all that kind of stuff. I would certainly appreciate it. Hit me up on Twitter, at GaryWCE, or X, whatever you want to call it. Or you can email me, Gary at winningcureseverything.com, and share the show out. Tell your friends about it. Uh, Number seven, topic number seven, last one. Jake Paul and Mike Tyson, Saturday, July 20th, Cowboys Stadium, and it's going to be broadcast on Netflix. So Netflix really trying to get in on this live streaming sports stuff. I'm, I'm intrigued. But again, Mike Tyson, nearly 60 years old, and Jake Paul is still in his 20s. What are we doing? Now, it's on Netflix. It's free. I'm going to watch it. But, whew, I don't know. This could be a debacle. Could be, But I guess, I mean, you've seen Mike Tyson getting, getting ripped right now. He looks good. He looks good. All right, let's get out of here. You guys know what to do. WinningCuresEverything.com, at WinningCures on Twitter, at GaryWCE. Subscribe, share the show, tell your friends. I hope you all have wonderful weekends. Uh, I'll be back again, I believe, on Monday. I'm leaving town on Wednesday morning. So if I get to record another pod after the Monday one, it, we'll see. Maybe I'll record some from uh, from where I'm going. We shall see. All right. Uh, with that said, take care of yourself. Take care of each other. God bless college football, and hopefully all of your tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. If you want to toss in a question, you can email me, Gary, at winningcureseverything.com. Make sure and hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.